Hi, everyone, and welcome to the fall 2023 episode of the Jackson Heights Beautification Group podcast. I'm your guest host, Chad Tyndall, and I play trumpet in the Jackson Heights Orchestra. Today, we have a very special guest. He studied viola performance as an undergrad at Azusa Pacific University, where he also conducted the Chamber Singers. Then he came to New York City for the master's program in orchestral conducting at the Aaron Copeland School of Music at Queens College, where he also managed the Queens College Conductors Workshop. He conducts many different orchestras around the New York City area, including the Litha Symphony Orchestra, Queens College Orchestra, Yonkers Philharmonic. He works with contemporary music ensembles like Pink Noise and New York Sound Circuit, and spent five years as the principal conductor of the Golden Rose Opera. Recently, he was appointed as the interim artistic director of the Jackson Heights Orchestra for the 2023-2024 season. Alex Wynn, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Chad. Great to be here. Very excited. And I know we've been waiting a long time for this conversation, so I'm excited. Let's start with a quick promo for the upcoming Jackson Heights Orchestra concert, which will be held Tuesday, December 12th at 7 p.m. at St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Jackson Heights. There is no admission fee. As a community orchestra, our mission is to make great music accessible to all members of the community. We'll talk more about that concert program later in the show, but for now, don't forget to mark your calendars and see the website jhorchestra.org for details on donating to support the orchestra so we can keep making this music available to everyone. That's right. We're so excited to see you. That's December 12th, 7 p.m. And uh, I, I love that the community comes out for it because every time I've been to a Jackson Heights Orchestra concert in the past, I have seen so many faces light up and, and you can tell just from the warmth, the feeling that everyone is maybe around the block, down the street, or they've come for years. So that that's what makes me excited to be a part of this and to see you all on the 12th. Yeah, it's definitely a neighborhood type feeling. We have a reception afterwards where we provide some drinks and snacks and people hang out and kind of it's a way for people to socialize after they get their cultural fill, I guess. You oh, could you say. didn't tell me that. Okay, now I'm really excited. Yeah, yeah. We'll bring some <laughs> wine. Come on out. All right, Alex, let's dive in. Let's talk about your background in music, actually. Did you grow up in a musical family? You know, I did not. I was, I guess you would call it the black sheep that went to music school, right? Oh. <laughs> we all feel that in some way. Uh, no, you know, I think a lot of my family, my cousins, we all took our lessons. We did piano or whatnot. I ended up on the violin and viol, well, violin first because pretty uncanny, you know, very practical reason. We couldn't fit a piano in our home. <laughs> we thought, which one's lightest? Let's go with that one. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I, I would say I'm kind of the only one that really came through, blasted off through college and, and uh, followed the musical path. Were you uh, on one of those like 116th violins? Like how young did you start? You know, I, I'd call myself a late bloomer because I never got to the 116th, okay. 1-8th violin. You started so. on that? What you start I, on? It was quarter? pretty normal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you say late bloomer, you know, you think like eight or nine for violinists, right? Okay. So, gosh, that. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Some people start when they're like three, two or three, I That's guess. That's right. That's right. Okay. How did you make the switch? Switch from violin to viola. Oh gosh, I bet uh, this answer comes from a lot of violas who also switched, but they get you with that scholarship in college, don't they? Is that what it was? <laughs> I have some great violist friends. You know, they're they're much. T I'm not that tall. They're much taller than me, so their answer was always, "Well, I was just too big as a kid." But that wasn't the case for me. But I found a wonderful viola teacher at Azusa Pacific. So being from Southern California, you know, Robert Becker was the principal violist of the Pacific Symphony mm. in Orange County. Beautiful concert hall, but he had been there for decades. So I, it was a pleasure to study with him, to learn with him, to uh, go on those viola camp summers in Colorado. There's more stories there. But <laughs> yeah, viola really came into play there. Still played a lot as a violinist, so being a, a doubler suddenly in my life brought one of the really fun moments when I first entered college, and that was playing If You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown. It was a double book, violin, viola. Really? Yeah. Can you imagine? No. Not, not just wind players get all that fun. No, yeah, because usually it's it's reed instruments doubling right. or something like that, or people have five saxophones around them or something yeah, like that. Yeah, should have gotten paid double, huh? <laughs> you don't get a doubling fee? <laughs> I'll have to look back. I was like, I have my B-flat trumpet and my C trumpet. I should get a doubling fee for that. You know? I felt so magnificent with two instruments there. I felt <laughs> what you felt for just a moment, a glimpse of it. you switching back and forth. <laughs> that was the, the, the little dream at the moment. That's very uncommon, though, I think. Very. Very, double on strings, very. right? Yeah. I felt pretty good about it, but that was a little start in the viola journey. You was, know? was that a musical? That's a musical? Yeah, You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown. Yeah, it was on that. Broadway, too, So, but our college did it, so okay, had the pleasure of that. Now, you actually started conducting as an undergrad, which is relatively uncommon, I think, right? I think so. Did you know you wanted to be a conductor kind of going into that program? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question because I think I can tell you safely it was... 
in front of my bathroom mirror when I was 10. Well, oh, wow. And okay. it was the Barber of Seville Overture in my, you know, headphones, whatever. It was probably a, funny. a CD. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know, I, I kind of think what orchestra it was. That's funny. But uh, that's what was playing in my head and in front of my mirror. And I thought, this is awesome. <laughs> you just started conducting in front of the mirror. Or you're like you moved to it. Really felt it too. Uh, having been a violinist from a young age, you start playing in youth orchestras pretty early, or at least after school orchestras. So you get a really good idea of what you need up on the podium and well, <laughs> what joy can be found on the podium too. Yeah. Hopefully the conductors that we follow also exude that. So you get a lot out of that as a kid. But I think that was really the the seed of inspiration for me. I think kids now get it from their parents when those clips show up on YouTube or their iPhone videos, right? We didn't have that. No, course. we didn't have that. <laughs> we did not have that. We had to record things on VHS and watch them over again. I did right. anyway. I mean, you're maybe a little younger oh, than me. I, so. I was right in there. I was right in there. But um, I, I'd say, you know, after that, as a string player, one of my favorite things was doing chamber music. And I thought, how do I expand this feeling of dialogue and working collaboratively together to to create something and, and be in conversation at the same time without words. And I thought, wow, I got to find every chance I can as an undergrad to hold the baton or to at least like make change affect those around me musically. And so in the States, you know, it, it's quite well known that there isn't really the same kind of training program in Europe. And so as an undergraduate student, you realize you just got to grab it every opportunity you can. It could be a wind ensemble. It could be a choir. Get in there and, and start learning. You're saying there's more opportunities for conducting study as an undergrad in Europe? I'd say they have a different kind of apprenticeship approach where you probably start in an opera house as a pianist, as a repetiteur, playing, accompanying and rehearsing and, and assisting. A lot of folks make their way up that ladder through a pretty established culture of, of training conductors. A lot of times through the opera house. Is that because there's just more opera houses there and it's more every little town has their own little opera house? And I would imagine. Yeah, I'd imagine so. And they've got the, uh, obviously the history of it all right there in, in, in Europe. So it looks very different here in the States. I'd say so much of young conductors really start at the master's level. And, and it's like a chicken or egg, right? You, you get into a master's by how? Getting experience with an orchestra. Right. You get experience with an orchestra how? By <laughs> getting, getting into a, a program. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, you just you grab at every opportunity. Did you choose Azusa Pacific because you knew that they would be open to you doing conducting? Is that part of what they do there? Or were you just really kind of making it happen? To be honest, it was really the viola um, the teacher that got me in there when I met him. And I knew that he had taught there and at a couple of other universities in Southern California. So I wanted to follow him. I'm going to be honest with you. It was probably a friend going on a preview day saying, please come. I'll buy you lunch. I'll buy you lunch. <laughs> I said, OK. And and uh, that is actually where I met my viola teacher. And, you know, <laughs> next thing you know, oh, that's four years. That's a music program. That's music school. Yeah, it sounds like you had a great experience there. I loved it. I loved it. Made a lot of friendships and and uh, but you know it. Then it was time to come to New York to go to the next step. So it wasn't long after you finished at Azusa that you did come to New York City to study conducting at Queens College. How did you decide on Queens College as the place you wanted to study conducting? I had met again met the conducting teacher prior to coming here through the Queens College conducting workshop. And because it was run for two weeks at a time every summer, that was my chance to kind of test out New York, take a trip here, learn, study, just kind of be enveloped with two weeks of conducting, working with strings, piano and orchestra. And uh, I, you know, I touched down in New York and I already knew it felt like home, first of all. <laughs> the energy so, hit you the energy. at the airport. You I know, get that when, when I land after coming back from a business trip or something, too. It's just there's an energy as soon as you land. It's so true. It's so true. I think I felt like home when I landed with my viol on my back in two suitcases. And like you said, that was JFK. I right. mean, what on earth? <laughs> right. That's right. So, yeah, that was a great trip, uh, a great chance to envelop myself in a workshop, in conducting and meeting again that teacher. That was Maurice Perez, who uh, at very apropos time right now, as as Bradley Cooper's Maestro movie comes out. Right. So there's a lot of history there with Leonard Bernstein and the New York film. Maurice was my teacher and he was also Bernstein's assistant 
uh, one of the first in the 60s with Seiji Ozawa. Wow. So talk about stories. I know everyone has Bernstein stories, but to be able to work with Maurice Perez at Queens College, um, this was the Aaron Copeland School of Music, carried a lot of weight for me, as well as working with him on Bernstein's Mass, a big theatrical production of Bernstein proportions, let's yeah. just say. You, you can imagine what comes with that. And holding the score that was premiered at Kennedy Center, you know, when that opened and there was a lot there, I felt like I belonged. So that was a great entryway to come in and gain acceptance into the, the master's program at the Aaron Copeland School of Music. So you have a direct lineage from... <laughs> that's that's really nicely putting it. I, I do like to remind myself what that holds. You know, there's a lot there. Yeah. Wow. And to study at the Copeland School of Music, I mean... That's a great lineage, too. All true. All true. And I love that music, too. So, What was the conducting program at Queens College like? I mean, other than just getting time on the podium, conducting groups there, I mean, what kinds of things are you studying and learning as you become a conductor? Yeah, at, at the Copeland School during the master's, we, you know, did the normal courses of history, orchestral repertoire and knowledge. They're a very big school on, uh, as with many, you know, ear training and theory. and But along with that, it's when you're in a conducting program, you're going to be more of an apprenticeship. There were two of us mm. following his lead. And he was a good transition between the old school maestro, you know, from the 60s into, and he realizes later in his life, he, he passed away in 2018. But he said, I know the world's changing. And in the very Jewish New Yorker maestro granddaddy <laughs> away, stroking his beard. And I know, I know the world's changing. I'm I'm doing my best. <laughs> well, let's dive into that a little bit. When, yeah. when you say old school maestro, what do you mean? Yeah, you know, well, the way he talked to the band, he would say the band, uh, <laughs> very strike up the band. Um, he treated the orchestra that he built at Queens College like any one of his own in the past. Kansas City, uh, you know, the New York Phil, as he was assistant back in the day, he treated them like the the adults they were. These students, these college undergrad and graduate players, and I loved seeing that because part of being a conducting student with him was, as he put it, just be there, be in the room, just be present. <laughs> and so, of course, from there, questions abound. And afterwards, you break things down, you debrief, you tear apart the score. What happened in rehearsal? How are we thinking about the next rehearsal? What's needed? What does this group need? You know, so there's a lot of dissecting. And it was just great to see how he could change the sound or the air in the room with a gesture or something, some story that he told. You know, uh, these are our students, so everyone's impressionable, of course. Sure, yeah. Right. And they're so, all listening, I'm and sure. And they're all listening, and they have to listen right. <laughs> for their credit. But I thought that was a great example, carrying through from a very kind of a golden era. We would think of those black and white films and maestros into, you know, a very present day college orchestra and how to shape it and how to affect and influence it. See, when you said old school, I had a totally different picture in my mind. Like he's yelling at people. He's just like, you know, flipping tables or I don't know. Like I had this like a <laughs> like when I think of old school teachers. Right. And they come and hit you with a ruler or something like that's what I, I had. That's what I had in my mind when you said that. <laughs> that's totally different than what you just described. So that sounds way better. Well, I did not say people were scared of it. <laughs> You know, there was a little bit of trepidation. There was, there's always a bit of let's not mess up or let let's make sure we do it right, and and that's a healthy amount. I think there are lines, of course, and, sure. and as we come into the 21st century, the role of the conductor has dramatically changed. I would even say in the last decade or two. How so? And uh, well, when when we work with an orchestra or group, we start thinking in a collaborative way that they are your partners. And I, as a young conductor, have to think, you know, these players have played this 15 times more than I've conducted this piece. Mm. But what am I going to bring to the table? And how can I bring us together where we otherwise wouldn't individually? So it's less about this is how I want you to play it and more about let's figure out together That's right. how we're going to yeah. play this. Yeah. Now, now, to be fair, I should in the job, as you're on the podium, you should have figured out everything you can figure out <laughs> and be prepared when you get up there. But I do really love to leave room. One of my favorite things through the rehearsal process is finding discoveries, finding things that, well, you, you really don't hear till you're there in front of the orchestra. And I, to me, that's exciting. It can be exhilarating. It can be scary because, oh, you were, you were taught to come 122% prepared. But there, I think there's room for discovery. And I think the humility 
if a conductor can bring that, can open up a lot of room for trust and respect between the players and the conductor. Now, counter that with the old school, traditional, <laughs> uh, what did we call it? A benign dictatorship of a maestro. <laughs> yeah, so. Not always so benign, probably. But... Uh, not always. Not always. <laughs> That's funny. So was he, he was trying to become more collaborative towards the end? Is that what he was trying to say? Yeah, as I knew him in the last years of his life, I saw the change. I saw the, the softness come in. I think it's interesting when you talk about the later years of anyone's a very fully well-lived life to how that can change. And I saw that with his students, his demeanor, the way he was open to a lot of new ideas. And how cool is this that someone in their 80s having conducted all of these orchestras during my senior recital, I, I did Mendelssohn's fifth symphony that okay. was the reformation symphony and he said you know all these years i never really dug into this and and to sit with him in our own time one-on-one -on -one and to say i found this look at this in the score i'm thinking about trying this what if this happened and he was open to that and he said huh you found something <laughs> and thought about that can you remember any examples of something that you I, I, not being a conductor, I don't really understand the process of score study and kind of what you're looking for, really. Yeah, I, I think in, in a symphony, uh, classical romantic symphony like that, you do have leeway and room as a conductor as your interpretation grows, as you study the piece and you figure out, well, there's a gesture, a cadence here, an ending to this section. Should I take some time? Should I make sure I push on? What effect does this have on the music? Is it following what the con composer has written or not written? You know, if it's not in the score, do we dare diverge? And so making decisions like that doesn't feel consequential when I'm sitting in a room alone with, <laughs> with pencil and paper. But when the rubber meets the road and the orchestra all is on your, your tail or your finger or your shoulder twitching up, you know, half an inch, then the, it, the train either derails or doesn't. Right. <laughs> so you start thinking these decisions have an impact down the road. So I think one of those examples would be making a decision like, I think I'm going to slow down here. I think it warrants it uh, based on the instrumentation, how many instruments are playing at the same time in that moment. Uh, what harmony is coming up after that? Is there a change for the audience's ear? Am I rushing through it? Am I making a moment? I, I have a friend who I says, make a moment out of it, you know, good or bad, make a moment. <laughs> Hopefully good. Hopefully good. And so I think it's it's one of those examples where he thought, and this is my teacher, you know, he's seen it all as our teacher. We think of our teachers. He said, oh, didn't occur to me. Wow. I think I like that. Let me look at it again. He's 82 at the time, 81, you know, and so that really blew me away. Really blew me away. That's great. So I treasure that. I know there's like blind studies that have been done around having people listen to a recording that was done, mm. you know, even with professional musicians who are always going to play together. Yeah. Right. You could have the New York Philharmonic without a conductor. They're going to play. That's right. Perfectly <laughs> together. But if you listen to a recording of them like that and a recording of them with a great conductor, even people who don't know which one is which, they'll vote for the one with the great conductor. They just like it more. There's more emotion in it. There's more better performance. Yeah. Right. So there's no question that having a great conductor on this stage like makes a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. I'd I'd like to think, you know, we still have a job. <laughs> Absolutely. AI is not going to get rid of conducting. <laughs> oh, I hope not. You know, <laughs> with everything coming. But you know what? I, I think that's a good point, because on a very high, you know, 30,000 foot view level, a great conductor can change the air when they walk in the room. You know, there there's a different kind of way of working. You, you can tell me as as someone who plays in the orchestra how that feeling might change. And it, it can be from night to night, rehearsal to rehearsal, how one person, 20 people or the conductor is feeling. But I think that can make a difference in the rehearsal process. And I think for any listeners, whether it's your first time or 100 time being at an orchestra concert, you might not see all the work that goes in before the day of the concert. And to me, that's always been like a uh, a coach on the field, whether you know team sport or individual sport. It is a team sport. Really. Yeah. And it has to work. I mean, in harmony, no pun intended. Absolutely. Or it doesn't function. Absolutely. And, and I think with that, all the practice and the rehearsing and the planning that goes on before the night of the concert is unseen, but where a lot of magic happens as well. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's a fun part of the process to take apart a piece of music as a group and then say, oh, wait, this section's a little rough. Yeah. Let's have just these two people play. Oh, do it again. Okay, let's add this third person in. Now you hear it together and you kind of get to see how right. it builds up to what it sounds like by tearing it down first. Yeah. Now, do you get, do you find any, any um of that? Does it feel exciting? How does that feel when you get to see something dissected and then brought back together? Uh, I, I'm an engineer by trade, so <laughs> I love taking things apart, and putting them back together anyway. Oh, I asked the right person then. Yeah. And so that appeals to my nature of just stripping things down to its bare bones. Like you do the same thing when you tear down a house, right? You gut renovate a house, you tear it back to the studs, you see what's there, and then you build it back up the way you want it. And that is very powerful to see that come together. Yeah. I, I think even as players now me being a a string player as well too sitting in there i i think i hear i think i've n known everything about this piece from my perspective too but there are still things that we can always listen for and to turn our attention towards and i hope to do that with with an audience too bring out different parts of a piece or an orchestra that can really really create cohesion i think players we serve ourselves well to remind ourselves in the rehearsal process of that. Do you find, as a string player, do you find yourself sort of drawn to breaking the string sections down more than, say, the brass players? Uh, I, you know, <laughs> well, where you're like, oh, no, this one's a down bow, this one's yeah. an up bow, but like maybe you don't do the equivalent of that with the well, brass. So. <laughs> Here's the power of self-awareness. I know that's my tendency. <laughs> <laughs> I bet the string players know and, and are expecting that too. But that, that actually, um, to answer the question, I think I like to turn my attention towards when I can and when I am uh, have studied the score to what I need to uh, turn my attention to in the winds or the brass or the percussion. And so maybe the strings aren't the first place I go to. But I know I'll always have that in my <laughs> ears. So they're, yeah. yeah, I'm not worried. Maybe they're worried. <laughs> Just kidding. But yeah, I, I like to at least spread the wealth a little bit here. And of course, you you don't want to you want to make sure every section has the attention that's needed. Right. Um, at the time it's needed. I have to imagine you've watched thousands of hours of other conductors studying their rehearsal techniques, studying how they perform and all of that. Other than your teacher and, and Bernstein, who are, who are your biggest influences in that world? Oh, gosh. Well, uh, if we're talking about footage watched over over time, I would say Carlos Kleiber. Uh, I don't know where Carlos he Kleiber. He was actually from Argentina, but Kleiber, you know, German Austrian conductor. His His father may have really started the big name lineage of Eric Kleiber, mm, also okay. a conductor. But you know what's funny about Carlos Kleiber? He didn't perform as much as we think other big name conductors did. He has very few recordings and footage comparatively. And so there, there's quite some stories about his stage fright, not stage fright, but his, um, uh, his need for perfection so inhibited him from just doing a performance. Afraid to just, make a mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not even afraid to make, he could not accept, you know, anything less than perfection. So his rehearsal footage is brilliant. Hmm. But, you know, today we would sit there and we would just kind of melt in our skin because he took apart every single thing. But those were, to me, those were the teachers, right? They taught an orchestra how to do Mahler or Beethoven. They taught an orchestra how to be listening cohesive. And of course, these are great players and great orchestras, but they, they were the maestros, the teachers of those orchestra to form the sound that they're known for nowadays. I think I love Carlos Kleiber because when you watch him, he doesn't conduct, he paints. Mm. You watch his arms, his gesture, his body, he paints what you hear. So I would be hard pressed if you found any measure consecutively where he was just beating in three or in four, even two measures back to back. <laughs> wow, that's wild. And do you think that is just came natural or, or do you think he practiced all of that and kind of performed it the same way every time he conducted the same piece? I have to think there was an inherent... Like with choreographing. Yeah. And so, you know. Well, I, I think there's always a bit of choreographing in your mind, as long as it serves the music and the musicians, right, right? right? You don't do anything to showboat or get in the way or to just play for the audience. Yes, we are We are there. We need an audience. We're there for the audience and the music and us and the composer. But some conductors are much more <laughs> grandiose, though. Right? Absolutely, but, yeah. absolutely. And that speaks to every different conductor's personality and what they bring and how, how they approach rehearsals and concerts. But I, th I think there was a beautiful mix of inherent natural 
organic feeling of the music with Carlos Kleiber. And of course, Brilliant Mind just knows what you need to hear and how to get it. And I think that's that's actually the process. How do you get the sound that you hear once you've studied this piece of music? Just ink on paper. Well, iPad these days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you think about it that way, as if you're painting while you're conducting? I, Maybe not I, rehearsal, yeah. but yeah, know, yeah. performance. There's a practicality to rehearsal. You got to get things done, That's right? That's right. Um, but I, I study my scores, and I think, what sound does this look like? How do I look like this sound? So even in the case that I don't have a rehearsal and I need to conduct the Jackson Heights Orchestra, how do I make this come alive just from what you see? Because let's say we didn't have a rehearsal. Right. <laughs> how do you convey all of that excitement or staccato or legato or connectedness in a slow movement of Beethoven's seventh? Or You know, so there's a lot there that you can do without a word in rehearsal. So that's good transition. Congratulations on your recent appointment as the interim artistic director for the Jackson Heights Orchestra. Thank you. Let's talk about what brought you to the JHO initially. Quite exciting. Yeah, yeah. it was earlier this year. Tell us what happened. Yeah, this was, uh, was it last Mar April? March. Yeah. March or April. Yeah. And so that was the concert of the Jackson Heights Orchestra where the founding director, Pat, Patricia Glunt, we had known each other for a while, but I had never received a call. I'm talking a, a ring call from <laughs> Old school. You didn't text Old you first? Yeah. You know, I wondered, well, you know, when you don't get any text, you better answer. <laughs> <laughs> Something's going on. I thought by by the third ring, I should probably take my toothbrush out of my mouth <laughs> and pick up the phone. It was late at night, I guess. The, it was early yeah. in the, it was Sorry. in the morning. Oh, it was in the morning. Okay. Of the day of the concert. Right. And so she, she'd ask me, hey, you know what? Uh, this situation's come up, but I want to uh, find out, you know, we're doing this concert tonight. And, um... How do you feel? What do you think? How would you be prepared to <laughs> step in? Step in. That's right. Yeah. So it was my day off. And I said, well, technically I can make it. I ran to my shelf as she was talking to me. I said, OK, Mozart uh, Figaro Overture. Got that score. OK, Beethoven 7. Got that score marked up. Whew. You conducted both of those before. Oh, well, yeah. Well, that's that's the lesson, right, kids? Always stay prepared. That's right. <laughs> but, you know, and, and there nice was... It's nice to some obscure stuff, right? Oh, like... thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes when the call comes, you know, obscure stuff or not, like the very new piece by Roger Stubblefield. Luckily, he was there and he took up the helm to conduct his piece. Right. So I got to focus on Mozart and Beethoven. So with that, I showed up at 6.30. I think a good number of musicians were there to give me my... my I think there were nine spots. <laughs> I had nine spots on a bullet point and I said, let's just check these for your sake, for my sake. Right. And off we went. The doors opened. An impromptu dress rehearsal <laughs> an hour before the concert. That's how you use every minute of it. So yeah. it's it's exciting, right? I mean, scary maybe, but you, But exciting. Yeah. 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 You're really getting called up to the show at the last minute. Yeah. Yeah. And and I was thrilled because what you want to see in that moment are hopeful and smiling faces <laughs> in front of you. You know, I'm thankful for that. And Susan, our concert master, was just she was wonderful and welcoming. And like I said, just made me feel at ease. And I hope I did the same for the orchestra. I think it was a little scary for us not knowing what to expect. But I can tell you what I heard in the back where the brass sits. I mean, it was the orchestra responded to you like amazingly well. And obviously that led to us wanting to work with you when Pat retired. And um, it's so nice to have you here. Uh, I'm grateful. I'm grateful to have uh, have everyone to work with. Yeah. Maybe you can explain to listeners who aren't so deep in the world of classical music what an artistic director does and how it's different than just being a conductor. Yeah. So on top of conducting and, and running rehearsals and, and performances and concerts, I'd say the artistic director these days, the role expands as we outreach into the community. We are representative of the orchestra, a voice for the orchestra, as well as uh, making sure that in the rehearsal process, we learn that musically we can be cohesive as one. But you also have to look further ahead over the course of a season or more in order to program. And that's a big part of it, programming and making those decisions for what is played, uh, what is included, what composers we uh, turn our attention to soloists, concerto soloists who are playing as singers, violinists, pianists, et cetera, et cetera. Trumpet players. Trumpet concertos, <laughs> brilliant ones. Uh, and so I think looking ahead, it's a long-term vision that's really important for the artistic director. And and this is 
more of a um, qualitative part, and it's the setting the tone, setting the tone of the orchestra, of the organization. And I think, you know, you can have a conductor who brings a seriousness to it or brings a vitality to it or a combination of both through their work and their speaking, their presence. So I think that there's a lot of hats one can wear, um, not to mention, of course, being present for fundraising opportunities and promotion of the orchestra uh, as part of the community or even wider. That's why we're here right now. <laughs> it's a lovely chance to do that. What are some goals that you want to accomplish with the orchestra this year? Yeah, I, I think when I mention programming, it's not just for, let's say, the enjoyment of the audience, right? I see programming as a goal to shape the orchestra. What we play can teach us a lot about our playing, not as individuals, right? I know I trust the trumpet section. <laughs> I trust the violinist. They're doing their work. They're playing. They're rehearsing. They're practicing. When you program certain pieces, you start to bring in stories from composers, from different voices. And you also bring in different types of music, genres, eras, classical, romantic, baroque, uh, modern, experimental, you know, if it goes that far, to teach us as an ensemble, as the Jackson Heights Orchestra or whatever your orchestra is, um, how to play together, how to listen to each other, what are our tendencies, what are our strengths, what are opportunities, right? So um, we always say like Beethoven, uh, this could be a string player thing. As a string player, Beethoven quartets are such a pure form of music that when it strips away everything, ooh, you better practice because it really shows. Yeah, <laughs> it will yeah. show your colors, right? Any so. small ensemble. Any, yes, you're exactly. Gonna, everyone's doing their own part. You, yeah. You got to, you, you know, mistakes will stand yeah, out. Yeah. Yeah. Be beautiful brass quintets and, and same idea. Yeah. From, yeah. Or even absolutely. duets or anything. Like. Absolutely. So I, I think there's a way to program smartly to work as an ensemble to uh, make one of those goals, which is to form a really cohesive group that plays, plays ever more. Uh, better and better level. So I, I love having that opportunity. If you program Beethoven, it teaches you certain things about Mahler. You know, if you program Bach, it teaches you certain things about Mendelssohn mm. and how they're connected. That makes for some great programming stories, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that is interesting. I mean, I've never thought about it on that level. You yeah. know, I'm just a dumb trumpet player here. Like, <laughs> move my three vowels up and down. So a crucial, <laughs> integral. I'm not saying it's not important, <laughs> but I've never thought about it, you know, in that sort of the arc of selecting repertoire across a whole year or in multiple years. I'm sure professional symphonies, right? Yeah. They program stuff many years out so they can book soloists Absolutely. five years in advance or whatever. Yeah. And I think with uh, the role of artistic director, it's you're also reaching out to how does this connect to the community, right? So what stories are we telling or teaching? How are we reaching out? How are we bringing people in that can relate to this music or learn about this music? So I think that's that's actually a great point. You know, it's reaching farther in time and space. As a community orchestra that wants to stay a community orchestra of volunteer musicians, where do you think the JHO should aim to be in three, five, ten years, both in terms of what's realistic and also in a way that stretches and improves the group along that vision? Mm -hmm. Should we be a bigger group? Should we play more complex repertoire? <laughs> should we play more concerts every year? Or like, what, what do you think we should be doing three, five, ten years from now? Yeah, I'm of the mind that there, there's always room to have a good mix to bring in new works, new works that are... Hopefully, and we've talked about this, Chad, about promoting local composers and local talent, uh, whether it's a soloist or a young composer. Queens, we have so many people and such a diversity that's to be celebrated. So I think at three to five years, we have a good mix of that. I know Pat did a fantastic job of that, looking at back at the programs, too. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's big shoes to fill and something to continue to strive for. And I would love to see the group fill up in terms of number of players, too, to grow an orchestra is always a wonderful thing, too. That expands our opportunity to play amazing repertoire, amazing pieces, big pieces. <laughs> so. You're like a professional guest because you're just leading me into the next topic. Oh, yeah, I, I swear I haven't seen any of this. So. <laughs> so let's talk about the upcoming December concert. Yes. Maybe you could just introduce the structure of the program to people and know what the big pieces and what to expect. Absolutely. I think so. December is going to be a, a really fantastic holiday mix. And I say mix because it really started with the idea of having a lot of great classics. And we had in mind also our soloists multiple soloists. And we have, uh, of course, Susan and Allison uh, on the Bach 
concerto for two violins. The double concerto. One, the yeah. double concerto of Bach. And so it's just such a staple of the repertoire. I can tell you, I, I grew up learning, playing it, and, and then even late nights in college, playing it just on the side with friends. But that's how... Uh, <laughs> how much of a, a cornerstone it is, you know, for so many players. But I think this is a wonderful way to showcase multiple people within within the orchestra and part of our group and also just introduce any newcomers who haven't heard this exquisite music. I mean, the second movement just oozes with sweetness and something that what we talk about, Bach really touching your heart. Now, I mean, that'll be our goal. And, and the excitement of the third movement, right? Having these two voices, uh, are they in conversation? Are they in entanglement with each other? I think it's a wonderful way to showcase uh, the orchestra that way. Yeah, I'm sure non, non-musicians probably don't think a, of music as being maybe a conversation between performers, but certainly when there's two soloists, mm. it couldn't be more of a conversation. <laughs> and they're, they're sometimes at the same playing together. Sometimes they're opposing each other, going back and forth. Absolutely. And I think the conversation as as in life, conversations can get tenuous, and it it's through the music of Bach that we can hear so many voices, the orchestra, the first soloist, the second soloist, all, as you said earlier, in harmony, but also in contention, too. I think that's the beauty of music. Bach pulls us into darker, deeper areas, but also gives us relief at the same time, and I hope a piece like this can take us on that journey. I want listeners and the audience to hear how these two voices go together, how they play at the same time, how they counter each other. A lot of uh, Bach's music brings us counterpoint. That is so magnificent. It could look like a, a math equation on the forefront, but when you hear it, I know when you hear something, you feel it. And and that'll be the amazing Bach double concerto. Are there any technical challenges as a conductor having two soloists instead of one in the concerto or? Oh, yeah. You know, the the ever <laughs> the the eternal struggle of a conductor and a soloist is. And this is a great question. Who's the boss? <laughs> Who's the boss? Right. So uh, it's a collaborative way of doing things. I, as a conductor, always love to work with the soloist to see what ideas they bring. I, of course, have ideas as well. And we see where they fit, where they make sense uh, so that, you know, you're not mixing and matching too many things. But I, I I always turn to the soloists first for their ideas. They are the front and center. And so I think some of those challenges come in when, um, and I think it's a great and a fun challenge when you have multiple soloists, you have different voices. How do we bring that all together? And I, I get the pleasure of presenting it to the orchestra that will be accompanying them. And so to fit that into their vision and make it all work is an exciting challenge. I bet. Yeah. How do you deal with the disappointment of the fact that there's no brass in this country? No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> we we, uh, we look forward to... <laughs> <laughs> so the structure of the program is that we're going to start with this Bach double violin concerto. Then what happens? And we get a little taste of winter, right? It's our holiday program. Uh, we have some Bach. We have some really fun ways to welcome the audience with uh, marches from Saint-Saëns, Bizet, and this wonderful Glazunov work called The Seasons. Now, we're doing the winter portion of the Four Seasons in Glazunov's uh, ballet. So it comes from ballet. So you can imagine, and there are instructions in this score. It's beautiful. I wish everyone could see it. The curtain rises, right? And you see the different characters. And these characters are snow, hail, frost, ice. So you can feel winter coming through through the strings and the pizzicatos or the woodwinds flurring down as they cascade through uh, these passages. Actually, I would say the warmth and the horns the brass sometimes brings in brings a different side of winter as well, too. So I think it's a wonderful approach to to bring into our holiday portion of the program, which does include wonderful selections from, I know, everyone's favorite Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker. Oh, yeah. That's always a yeah. crowd pleaser. Always, always. And, you know, aside from being a holiday popular classic, it really is some of the, I think, some of the best music out there. From a player's perspective, it's so fun to play. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Would you agree? Absolutely. <laughs> I, I certainly hope the orchestra finds a lot of great fun in it, too. So yeah. we've got a couple of those. And along with it, uh, for, for a community, you know, some familiar holiday favorites, carols, sing-alongs, and, of course, the wonderful uh, Handel Messiah. So the Hallelujah Chorus. Nice. You got to have that. Yeah. Will that be the closing piece? <laughs> we'll actually close with a little fun send-off. So I don't know if I should say it here. Oh, okay. You don't need to ruin the surprise. <laughs> I guarantee it'll be fun. 
<laughs> you're going to be a sing-along. You're going to turn around and conduct the audience? Or? I'll have to. I'll have to. You know, there's a few words in there. Okay. Hallelujah. <laughs> So those times of conducting the chorus in college uh, didn't go to waste. No, not at all. And I'm I'm glad too because boy, I'm glad to have worked with singers because in my time in New York, opera has certainly fallen in my lap like I never imagined as well. So opera conducting is a whole nother beast in itself. So you mentioned the Glazunov was actually originally written for ballet. How does the connection to dance influence the music? Like, mm. do you think? I mean, have you seen the ballet? Do you think about what the dancers are doing when you're conducting? Yeah, I haven't seen the ballet live or in person. But, you know, when you think of ballet music, music for ballet, for the stage, the first thing that comes to mind is your pacing. What do dancers need from the orchestra, right? It's the timing pacing because, let's be honest, they're working with gravity. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, so much of that pacing comes through when you work with the orchestra, even without the dancers. You start thinking about waltzes, how how that feel of one, two, three, one, two, three dances, right? You wouldn't go too fast or too slow so as not to disrupt the movement in a ballet dancer. So I think on the podium, when we talk about embodying the music, it also comes with a certain amount of, the word you put it, choreography. Yeah. But in my mind, of course, in my mind, in the tempo and how that is... Uh, directed or instructed to the orchestra. So I think ballet has a big, big, big effect and influence on orchestral music through pacing and, and dancing, of course. And we have to feel that too as an orchestra so that the audience can feel it. It's funny because I don't, I don't think about dancers dancing when I'm, when I'm playing, let's say, the Nutcracker even. Mm -hmm. But um, maybe I should. <laughs> there's, there's the famous, uh, well, hopping back on the Bernstein train, I think when he's working on so many stage productions too, you know, ballet gives you the trouble. And, and, and I don't know exactly who said this, but a fun little excerpt from any conductors. Okay, okay, it's too fast. Okay, it's too slow. And meanwhile, you're probably conducting the same tempo. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I, I can't attribute that quote at the moment, but... <laughs> <laughs> That's is, the first thing. Is this piece, the, the Seasons, is it often performed by orchestras alone without dancers? You know, I think there there's a popularity um, because I actually talked with fellow conducting colleagues about this as far as, hey, what's great to program on a holiday concert as well? And, and this I haven't seen as often or as frequent. We all see mm. Tchaikovsky. We all see, you know, for Christmas concerts, uh, Britain, the harp players get to work, right, for the season. Yeah. Um, it's also the, one of the only times we get to bust out the piccolo trumpet. That's right. That's you know? right. So, you know, there's a lot um, for everyone, I think. And But because it's the seasons, it's not necessarily glued to a Christmas holiday season. Right. So, but we're taking that. We're picking that selection out. That's great. Oh, because usually we think of people doing Vivaldi's seasons. That right? too. That as well. Yeah. yeah. So this is nice to have something a little bit different. I think it's going to be fun for everyone. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Well, let's talk about after the December concert, because you've talked about that you're setting the vision for the whole year as the artistic director. What's going to be coming up for the March and May concerts? What do you, I mean, maybe it's not fully formed yet, but what do you kind of have in mind? Yeah, I'm really excited because uh, what we're looking at right now for the March and May concerts involves exploring the American journey or what I like to think of the lineage of American music in terms of classical music. So something that really comes from my time with Maurice Perez, who wrote the book From Dvorak to Duke Ellington, traces the four very impactful years that Dvorak spent in New York, and he made a visit to Iowa and Chicago for the World's Fair. And of course, big, big pieces we attribute to Dvorak came from there, the American String Quartet, the uh, New World Symphony, uh, he started his cello concerto here in New York. And so what a time, what a productive time for him. He must have music. been very inspired. Yeah. I, I would say so. And he really helped in his time in New York. Dvorak really helped start the American School of Music formally, you know, for people to study. And part of what I learned working with Maurice Perez is that he really took to heart and told the class of composers here to find their own voice within the American lore and folk and traditions and styles. And what does that come from? We understand that to be uh, spirituals, right? From enslaved people, as well as their roots, African roots. And so you start to see his students produce other students, produce other students. And that lineage eventually leads to Aaron Copeland. That lineage leads to George Gershwin. And through some mentorship, Duke Ellington. Wow. 
when you think of that, you think I don't of, think of Dvorak to Ellington personally. I mean, that, that's, exactly. That's very interesting. Yeah. And so he took a lot of inspiration from visiting the Midwest and finding those spirituals like going home. His student, Harry T. Burley, also really made that a spiritual song, too. Going Home is the second movement of Dvorak's New World Symphony. And so while we we won't uh, harp on the New World Symphony, I know it's often played. I'm excited that that program will include Dvorak's Eighth Symphony, uh, also very popular, but one one I love and, and am excited to share. So, yeah, I look forward to pieces by Copeland, Gershwin, Dvorak, just to kind of follow that story here in America. You've talked about maybe throwing an Ellington piece in there. Is that, I would uh, love to find some. Yeah, we're working on it and, and seeing, you know, there's a lot of great arrangements. Let's let's uh, test the waters. Let's throw some jazz in there. <laughs> what's, what's the piece that you would want to do if you had, you know, your way? It's a big piece, great saxophone solo, but uh, Duke Ellington's Black, Brown, and Beige. Uh, also an arrangement from my dear teacher, Maurice Perez, right? So uh, for orchestra. But, you know, there's a lot of great uh, jazz dancers that have been arranged for orchestra as well. I'd be excited to to explore with Jackson Heights. That would be cool. I've only heard, I've seen Jazz Lincoln Center Orchestra perform their black, brown, and beige. Yeah. So I, I, I've never heard the or- I mean, I've never seen the orchestral one done. Yeah. I've heard it on Spotify, yeah. but it's quite special. Quite special. It'd be great if we could pull it off. And then, <laughs> and then the other concert. And then the other uh, theme that we're centering around is secrets and tales. So you know, a very enchanted kind of program, and it starts with Mozart's overture to the Magic Flute which is an opera, just all around those secrets and, and enchantments, right? And we have also connected to that the Mozart Clarinet Concerto with uh, clarinetist Dan Olson. Very excited to have him part of our, our program this coming season. The principal clarinetist in the Jackson Heights Orchestra. That's right. That's yeah. right. So very excited to, again, again, really showcase our talent and to present a wonderful piece of music to uh, the community, too. And one that's near and dear to my heart uh, that has a lot of enchantment to it, Ravel's Mother Goose Suite. Now, we may choose some selections to play in there, but I think if there's anyone that can work magic on an orchestra, it's the hand of Ravel, a French composer who is a master orchestrator, brilliant at setting the sounds of what you hear throughout the orchestra to create one very beautiful piece. Well, to me, whatever he wrote. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, it's just such a wonderful uh, work, the Mother Goose Suite by uh, Maurice Ravel, and and finally, the the biggest secret of them all, Elgar's Enigma Variations, uh, a series I would say a series of movements that all detail one friend or another person close to the composer Edward Elgar, and so he puts in these little um, enigmas where the theme runs through every movement, but. You know, there's there's more um, more to dig into there. Interesting. Yeah. Maybe yeah. we'll dig into that on a future podcast. I episode. can't wait. I can't wait. So you, folks at home can do their research first. But it's an exciting piece. That's awesome. All right, Alex, thanks for joining the show today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we'll put all these links in the show notes. But if you'd like to read more about Alex or see his upcoming performance calendar, his website is alexwinmusic.com. For more information about the Jackson Heights Beautification Group, our website is jhbg.org, and we are at jhbgny on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can also sign up for the mailing list to receive email announcements of upcoming events and programs. The Jackson Heights Orchestra is at Jackson Heights Orchestra on Facebook and at JH Orchestra on Twitter and Instagram. Our website is jhorchestra.org, where you can see our upcoming schedule. We are dependent on donations and support from community members to continue bringing this great music to Jackson Heights, and we greatly appreciate any support you have to give. Once again, our next concert will be held on Tuesday, December 12th at 7 p.m. at St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Jackson Heights, and we hope to see you all there. Thank you for listening. Thanks. Hope to see you soon. 